The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things. First Chapter Friday read aloud video with Amanda Ziba, the word nerd, and author interview with Rob Renzetti. Hey readers, let's do something different today and draw. Today as you listen, pay special attention to the way Rob describes the horrible bag of terrible things. In your mind, what does this bag look like? Draw it out. To take it to the next level, try adding labels and adjectives around the image of your horrible bag. After the video, share your results with your classmates. And now, here we go for the first chapter Friday of The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things by Rob Renzetti. Okay, forgive me, but I lied. One more quick thing. I want to give a shout out to Mrs. Rising's library students at Dan River Middle School in Ringgold, Virginia. Thanks so much for being here today, you guys. I hope you love this story. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with a Word Nerd, in another First Chapter Friday video. This week I'm going to be reading to you from The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things by Rob Renzetti. And when I think of this book, I think of two things. I think of scary and I think of funny. And I think it's very unique that the author, Rob, pulls off both of those all the time throughout almost the entire book. I was either scared or laughing. And to me, that seems like such a big task. Like, how do you make both of those two very opposite emotions happen at the same time or frequently again and again. And we're going to be able to talk to Rob specifically about that when I interview him after I read you the first chapter. But before we get to that, I'm going to read you the blurb so you know a little bit more about this hilarious and creepy story. There's a strange bag on Zenith Maelstrom's doorstep. Zenith finds a bag's battered exterior and jagged stitches repulsive and also irresistible. Unable to keep his hands off it, he pricks his finger on the ornate clasp, unleashing a sinister, spider-like creature that snatches Zenith's unsuspecting sister, Apogee, and drags her inside the horrifying and hideous world of her back. Zenith travels into the bag to bring her back, but terrors lurk within the scenes. From a trio of disembodied, blood-drinking mouths to the great worm, an eldritch horror who seems to have a dark, insidious purpose for Apogee. Zenith will have to dig deep to save himself and Apogee from this bizarre realm and escape the horrible bag before it's too late. And before it gets too late here in your class time, I'm just going to dive right in to chapter one called The Horrible Bag. The bag groaned. When he lifted it off the front porch, she could have swore that it groaned. He dropped the bag to the entry floor and he took a step back. He listened closely for any further sounds. None came. He leaned closer to the bag still. Still nothing. No more groans, also no shipping label. No name or address. Who delivered it to their house? Was it something his parents had ordered? There was no way to find out till they got home from work, and that wouldn't be for hours. In the meantime, he was stuck inside the house with his big sister. Did she know something about this? He doubted it. If there was any fun to be had with the bag, she would surely put an end to it. Sometimes she treated her baby brother like he was an actual baby. Zenith Maelstrom was 11 going on 12, and the going on couldn't go fast enough for him. He could not wait to grow up so everyone would stop bossing him around, especially his sister Apogee. What he wouldn't give to be the older sibling. Zenith took a step closer to the bag. It was the size of a small suitcase, but shaped like an old-fashioned doctor satchel. It felt old, and it looked exhausted. It slouched there on the floor, unable to stand upright. The bag had bad posture. The bag had bad skin as well, or more actually, bad skins. It was made of several types of animal hide. Some patches had the smooth appearance of finished leather, while others looked as though they'd been stripped completely, directly off some exotic beast, bristled hair and all. One section sported rough reptile scales. Various pelts were sewn together with heavy, haphazard stitches. This rough-hewn exterior was ad adorned with an improbably elegant, but tarnished, brass clasp that ran the length of the bag's opening. It had been fashioned to resemble the vines of a rose bush. A few rosebuds nestled among many, many sharp thorns. Bad skin, bad posture, a general air of hostility. The bag reminded him of Kevin Churl, neighborhood braggart and one of Zenith's least favorite people. Had Kevin sent the bag to him? 
Was this some sort of revenge for what had happened on the pond in Kalikov Park, delivered almost a year and a half later? It was a long time to hold a grudge, but still... Zena scratched the car, scar hidden under the hairline above his ear, and then caught himself and stopped. He decided this wasn't Churl's style. If Kevin were going to leave something on his doorstep, it would probably be a dog turd inside a flaming paper sack. A heavy moan sounded from the bag as its metallic, metal-rimmed mouth opened wide. Zenith grabbed his baseball bat from the corner and brandished it at the bag, waiting for whatever was inside to leap out. Nothing leapt out. Whatever moan must have been too tired to do any leaping, or too hurt, or too clever. Perhaps it was waiting for Zenith to stick his head into the opening so it could jump up and latch onto his face. Zenith decided to toss the bag back out the front door, just as soon as he'd taken a quick look inside. He had to look inside, no doubt about that. His sister always said that Zenith was as curious as a killed cat. Apogee was clever and unbeatable at most games and puzzles, but idioms often got the better of her. Holding the bat in front of him, Zenith inched his way closer to the bag. He leaned forward and peered down inside. It was dark. He retreated and turned on the overhead light. He inched up to the bag again. Still dark. Darker than it should be with the light on. He stuffed the bat down into the bag and poked around, trying to rouse whatever might be lying coiled up inside. All he found was the bottom and the four corners. He used the bat's knob to hook the bag's handle, and he shook it. Nothing. Doing exactly what he swore he wouldn't, he stuck his head into the opening. Nothing latched onto his face. Nothing happened because there was nothing in the bag. He dropped it to the floor and returned his bat to the corner. He was relieved and disappointed. It was, pretty, it was a pretty poor practical joke, whatever pulled it. Absent-mindedly, Zenith went to close the claps, clasp and nicked his finger on one of the thorns, just a pinprick, but deep enough to draw blood, a single drop of which fell into the bag's open mouth. Zenith let out a cry of pain. The bag responded with a sigh of pleasure. Zenith's eyes went wide. He scrambled backward till he hit the wall. The bag snapped shut, straightened up, and shivered with delight. A change of color rippled across its various skins. The bag's entire surface became brighter. Awake was the word that popped into Zenith's head. Slowly, the bag's mouth opened into a wide grin, and a terrible thing came crawling out. Now, if you want to see what happens next, in the horrible bag of terrible things. Uh, you should totally pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore, or as always, you can grab it via the link down in the video description box from my favorite indie bookstore, Birdie's Bookstore, um, or Amazon. And, um, but now, uh, we don't have time to be buying books right now. We have to go and talk to the author, Rob. Uh, so stay tuned and join us because I can't wait to hear his answers to the questions I have for him. All right, readers, we are here with author Rob Renzetti. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about your book, uh, The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things. Oh, look, we, we both have uh, Book twins. Um, and my first question is, what was the story spark or the story seedling? Because this is kind of an off-the-wall you know, a little bit uh, strange, shall we say, story. Um, yes. And I'm curious to know where it came from. Well, uh, well, there's a couple of different answers, but the simplest one is it came from my wife. Um, the title came from my wife. Um, we are pack rats. She's really the pack rat. Um, <laughs> but We won't so, tell her you said that. <laughs> so, so we have lots of paper around the house and uh, it gets strewn about and then we'll get into a cleaning frenzy and sometimes we'll clean it, go through it, take care of it all. Sometimes we'll just be like, that's too much to deal with. Let's put it aside. So there was a giant grocery, paper grocery bag full of like old tax receipts and 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 phone bills and stuff, stuff that had been paid, but like we need to keep this for taxes or whatever. And it was in the corner and she started referring to it as the horrible bag of terrible things. So that is the original horrible bag of terrible things. And she's got away with phrases and that was a great one. And yes. so that just stuck in my mind. And I'd wanted to uh, write an original 
a like middle grade spooky story. And that title just seemed to fit it perfectly. So I kind of, that was the spark. And I kind of figured out, well, what would that mean in a practical yeah. sense? And it kind of took off from there. That is so great. And I always love asking authors this question because for some people, um, the title comes last. Like I know when I'm writing something like that is one of the last things that I do. Um, and so you, and I think, I don't know if you know who Greg Logstad is. He wrote a book called Alibi Junior High. Um, and so for that. him, he was like the title, the title came first. Like sometimes That's a great you, title. Write, you just hear those things and you're like, I got to write something about that. Yeah. That's unusual for me too. Usually the title will come close to last for me. Um, mm -hmm. and it's more about the characters and the story, but in this case, the title came first. Okay, well, let's talk about the story because what the, the things that stuck out to me were this story is both creepy and funny at the same time. And it's strange to me because those are two very different emotions and oftentimes they don't occupy the same moment. Like when you're truly scared, um, like you laugh about it later, right? Or you maybe laugh nervously, but th like they're, this is really funny. There are really funny parts in here. So I'm curious how you managed to get both of those emotions in the story um simultaneously um and how you like thought about balancing like the creep factor versus the fun factor sure well i mean and you're right when you're super super scared you're going to just be scared um but i do find like if i'm watching a movie and i watch lots of horror movies horror movies that are unrelentingly scared or there's no moment where the characters pause and look at each other and go this is crazy right like to me, you have to have those kind of like pause, like let's check in with each other about what's yeah. going on and how crazy it is and maybe have some gallows humor about it because that's how the world really is. That's how humans really are. I, I, I never, I, I'm always kind of bored by a movie that's unrelentingly one note, um, okay. especially when it comes to horror movies. Um, you know, there are some exceptions to that, that, that rule. But I think even in the grimmest horror movie or the grimmest drama, if you don't have a moment of levity or just a moment to to kind of release that tension, I don't I don't find it as enjoyable as a viewer, and I don't find it enjoyable as a writer. So it was both for my own pleasure and for what I think would suit an audience of whatever age to kind of have the full gamut of emotions. Yes, there are mm -hmm. some very scary things that happen to Zenith and to his sister Apogee in this book, but at the same time, he is very much like me. Zenith is very much uh, my avatar in the story. He has this kind of um, sarcastic, skewed perspective on things, and he is going to have moments where he just is going to crack a joke or he's going to yeah. undercut the seriousness of what someone's trying to tell him because that's just the nature of who he is and it's wow. the nature of what the kind of stories I like to make. Um, as far as how I balance that stuff, it's that kind of just is on instinct. Um, you know, there yeah. are a couple of uh, places that I knew, well, it's going to get scarier here and I want to have a moment of levity before, but it just kind of as you're going around and figuring out the beats of the story, it just kind of works its way into place. And luckily you have several drafts where you can kind of massage the different levels yeah. of scary versus humor. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, to me, that's the kind of, I don't know if I'm ever going to write a scary book where there isn't some sort of sense of humor, some sense of black humor, because that's just my personality and, and it's kind of my, my author voice. So. Yeah. When you said you watch a lot of horror movies, right? So you, ex you are very well versed in this genre and how it works. And, you know, I'm sure you've read a lot of scary and funny things as well. Mm -hmm. And so when you said it's instinctual, like it's, it's probably more that you've fed yourself a lot of, a lot of that content. And so it just, it feels very natural. And so I think that's a good reminder to kids too, is just like, if you want to be a good storyteller, you have to experience a lot of stories. Yeah, I mean, I love stories of all natures. I was a reader from a young age. I read, you know, I read books. I read comic books. I watched cartoons a lot. I watched movies a lot. Um, I started off as a as a scaredy pants. I was very much a, 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 anything scary. I avoided for maybe the first ten years, and then somewhere in my preteen years, it all flipped mm -hmm. over. And I think actually the the gateway. Uh, medium for that was a po uh, a, a, a collection of uh, um poe short stories okay. uh, that my mom gave to me when i was in the hospital and uh, i fell in love with poe and then that was kind of i was off to the yeah. races in terms of scary stuff awesome well i know that you do a lot of other kinds of storytelling uh specifically in animation um and i'm curious if 
Uh, so for those of you who who don't know uh, about Rob, he's he's worked for lots of different kinds of things, you know, animation and books, and I'm sure he can tell us more about that. But is it difficult to switch different mediums of storytelling? Like you're like, okay, I'm writing a novel now, or okay, I'm doing storyboarding now. Like, is that a hard flip for your brain to make, or not really? It's not. It's not hard in terms of. Uh, well, first of all, I always write more than I have room for and time for. So if I'm writing a seven minute cartoon or drawing a seven minute cartoon, it'll end up being eleven to fifteen minutes, and we got to cut stuff. If I'm working on a half hour cartoon, I'll I'll write enough for forty minutes. So I always overwrite. I always have too many ideas, uh, which is also the case with my books. Every book has turned out to be like twenty to twenty five percent longer than it should be. Uh, but I don't mind that. That's a that's a great problem to have because uh, yeah. you've got you've got stuff to choose from, and you can decide what needs to stay and what has to go. Um, I don't find it difficult only because in my mind it's all the same kind of storytelling, which is character based storytelling. So even though I came up with the title for the horrible bag first, it's really about the characters. It's about mm -hmm. Zenith Maelstrom and his sister Apogee and all the weird creatures and monsters they meet, and it's really about how those character what those characters are like, how they interact what kind of choices Zenith is going to make because of who he is. And that's always been the case for all the shows I've worked on. Like, uh, you know, Dexter's Lab is one of the first shows I worked on. Uh, your kids might know Gravity Falls, which is more mm -hmm. a more recent uh, show I worked on. I worked on Kid Cosmic and uh, Big City Greens. All these shows are based are on the characters and the stories really come from who the characters are. So to me, it's all that same kind of storytelling, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. And that information leads great into my next question, because uh, you mentioned, you know, some Nickelodeon stuff and some Disney stuff. And I love like a real good fangirl moment or like, you know, those celebrity situations are just like, gosh, I can't believe like that I'm here. And so what's one of your favorite moments of uh, like a pinch me moment from when you were working at uh, Nickelodeon or Disney? Well, there, I mean, I could list a lot. Um, I've met a few celebrities because they will come in and do voices. Um, one that I didn't, one celebrity that I didn't directly work with, but that I saw very in my career, like within a couple of um, weeks of starting out at Hanna-Barbera, which is a legendary cartoon studio. Kids might not know it, but um, uh, we had an office that was uh, next to this conference room and we walked out from our office one day. And in the conference room, I saw Dick Van Dyke, the legendary comedian, <laughs> And he was having a lunchtime meeting, reading through a script that he was going to do, do the voice on. And he was laughing and eating a sandwich. And I, I just like, I'm a huge Dick Van Dyke fan, loved his, the Dick Van Dyke show when I was a kid. So seeing Dick Van Dyke, that was like, I'm, I try not to be starstruck when I meet celebrities. Yeah. I try not to, I try not to fanboy out too much with them and give them a lot of praise. Not because I want to be cool, but just because I don't want to make them uncomfortable when they're there right. to do a job. Um, and I didn't get a chance to talk to Defiant Dot. I would have loved to talk to him, but just seeing him was such a thrill for me. And it was so early in my career. It was really my first celebrity sighting. Um, you yeah. know, and I've gone on to meet a lot of celebrities, both big and small. Mark Hamill's probably the one that everybody will be crazy about. Luke Skywalker himself. He was a he's been a voice on a couple of different projects I've worked on. So I've met Mark a number of times and he's a great guy. And so I, you know, kind of know him just the littlest bit, but uh but seeing Dick Van Dyke was really probably my biggest fanboy moment. Yeah, very cool. And like you said, it's so early on in your career, so you're going to be like, "This is what my life is like now." Like it was, just it was crazy. Lunch, you know. So <laughs> um, for for those of you in the audience who might not know, uh, if you've seen Mary Poppins, um, he he is the guy who d does the the chalk. He is the chimney sweep. Um, yep. So if you're if you're like, I have no idea, that might be your most. Uh, accessible uh peek yeah. into that so all right one last question for you and that is that if there is a kid who is listening and they are curious or maybe interested in pursuing a creative career um what advice would you have for them well i mean you kind of already mentioned advice manner which is just like if you want to be a writer read a lot if you want to be an mm -hmm. artist watch watch cartoons look at art books draw um, I spent so many rainy days when I was a kid drawing and uh, and then writing stories with the cartoon characters I came up with. So I was kind of practicing my craft without even knowing it because I loved it so much. Um, and I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a cartoonist. I didn't really know until I was a cartoonist that I was also a writer because I was writing the words and, yeah. and the situations for those characters. Um, 
but I was doing, you know, if you have a love for this stuff, uh, it's no, it's no burden to indulge in what you love. And if you love it enough and you have a passion for it enough, you can do that for a living. You can become a writer. You can become a cartoonist. You can do one of these creative, uh, these creative uh, tasks that aren't really tasks. They're kind of hobbies that you get to be paid for. And, um, yeah. you know, some days you won't want to do it, but most days it's joy to be able to make a living um, drawing cartoons and writing words. Um, for me, I've been very, very lucky that I've been able to make it my, make it my job and my career and my life. Yeah. I love that because, you know, it's like, like you said, it's like a, a hobby that's fun that turns into to getting paid for like, you know, like I get to make these videos and talk to amazing creators. And that's, that's my, that's not even like my air quote job. That is my job. And so how, how cool and fun for us. So yeah. Thank you so, so, so much, Rob. So um, I know that this is the first book in a series. I think the second one is out and there's going to be a third. Here it is. This is the second one. The Twisted Tower of Endless Torment. And the third one, not that the kids are going to be on social media, but I just did the cover re reveal on Twitter and on Instagram today. Um, and you'll, yeah, it's not on my website yet, but I am at robrenzetti.com. You might be able to see the third book there sometime soon. That's called The Cursed Cloak of the Wretched Wraith. All these, all these titles have turned into tongue twisters, <laughs> yes. but that just, the cover was just revealed today. Yes, that's the third book that'll be out next summer, but the first two books are available. Horrible oh, bags yeah. in, in, in paperback as well. So if you want to get the paperback version of horrible bag, that's available as well. Amazing. I will be sure to link everything down there for people to easily access and check out. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Rob and readers. Thank you so much for tuning in to hang out with us today. We will see you again next week for another First Chapter Friday video. Happy reading. Happy creating. Thanks, Amanda. To continue reading The Horrible Bag of Terrible Things by Rob Renzetti, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the video description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. I've got more than 200 middle grade and young adult novels there waiting for you, ready to check out and listen in. And before you go... Remember to share your drawings. What did you come up with? I can't wait to see. Thanks so much for visiting my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. I hope you come back again for more First Chapter Fridays, direct instruction videos, brain breaks, and more. I'll see you again next time. Happy reading.